How to Think, a book by Tom Chatfield. You can think better, tech philosopher Tom Chatfield promises. He offers engaging explanations of the principles of critical thinking and, as examples, applies these principles to timely, relevant issues, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. He covers how to question your own assumptions and biases, improve your attention, and formulate strong, logical arguments. This common-sense, practical, personal development book offers helpful tools for anyone who wants to think and discuss more clearly and rationally. Okay, let's hear the first takeaway. Thinking about your own thinking can help you understand yourself and the world. People see the world through the lens of their own perspectives. You'll perceive and experience events such as the COVID-19 pandemic in your own individual way based on your age, wealth, ethnicity, and location, among other factors that can influence your thinking. To think more objectively, actively reflect on your thought processes. To find the blind spots in your thinking, be as clear as possible about the question you seek to answer. Explore the question and what you don't know about it. Seek out information and get advice from trusted sources. Keep revisiting and reassessing your knowledge. Self-interrogation and reflection will help you understand yourself and the world. Now for the second takeaway. Attentiveness and reflection build habits that support clear and critical thinking. In your day-to-day routine, you perform everyday tasks without deep and profound analytical thought. If these functions required significant mental energy, you probably wouldn't leave the house. For much of daily life, humans rely on habits, instincts, and emotions, and heuristics. Habits are the things you do with sufficient regularity that they require little conscious thought. Instincts and emotions, such as tiredness, hunger, and thirst, lead you to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that help you make decisions, such as what to eat in an unfamiliar restaurant or which political candidate to support. Emotions and heuristics work best when the context is familiar, in an evolutionary sense. For example, humans have been making judgments about one another's trustworthiness for centuries, so emotions have evolved to help. People also draw on personal expertise to make judgments as when a firefighter evaluates the danger of a blaze. In novel or complex situations, or ones that require expertise you don't have, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, a response called constructive doubt will serve you better. When you respond with constructive doubt, you recognize that you lack enough information or experience to make a judgment. Instead, you think deeply about what matters most in the situation. To make your thinking clearer and more critical, always pay attention and take time to reconsider your first response. Keep an open and curious attitude toward new ideas. Practice empathy regarding others' perspectives. Time for the third takeaway. Strive for clarity and logic in framing your arguments and in understanding those you hear and read. To help people understand your ideas, explain them in clear, concrete, everyday language. Precise-sounding technical terms can confuse readers or listeners. To achieve clarity in your writing, use an iterative process. First, plan, research, and take notes. Next, write. Then read what you've written, taking your audience's perspective. Continue to reread and edit your work to make it as clear as possible. In order to change readers' minds, writers often use emotional appeals. This tactic isn't inherently good or bad, but it is a common persuasive strategy, and you should be aware of its presence. Much of people's argumentation, and thinking for that matter, involves fallacies, statements that make a particular claim seem reasonable but don't make logical sense. Common fallacies include appeals to emotion, nature, authority, tradition, or popularity. For example, a million people can't be wrong, or it's always been done this way. Look for the following fallacies in other people's arguments and be careful to avoid them in your own. First, what aboutery? Claiming the issue under discussion has less importance than other issues as a pretext to change the subject. Second, conspiracy theories, 
suggesting a hidden sinister truth, one they don't want you to know, would explain things. Third, ad hominem, implying you can dismiss anything someone says because of the speaker's identity. Fourth, non sequitur, a conclusion that doesn't follow logically from the facts. The fifth fallacy is false dilemma, presenting a set of alternatives as if no other options exist. And finally, anecdotal evidence, giving a single example as if it proved a general principle. Here's the next takeaway. Question and engage with your own and others' assumptions. Assumptions are ideas and facts you take for granted as being true. For example, you might assume that the words on a page convey the same meaning to you as they do to others. In discussions about COVID-19 vaccines, for example, people make many assumptions about natural immunity, the trustworthiness of science, risk, power, and liberty. Different people hold fundamentally different assumptions about these concepts. When you are discussing a topic with a group of individuals who hold different assumptions, you can facilitate understanding by asking everyone to articulate their points of view. Clarify the areas where you agree and disagree. Focus on ideas rather than the people involved. Consider different lines of reasoning and debate and test all proposed ideas, taking nothing for granted. Decide on a final course of action by majority consent. Because assumptions often link to identity, people tend to take an accusatory stance against those who disagree with them. Instead, engage constructively with your own and others' assumptions by investigating rather than accusing. Do your best to understand where your own and others' worldviews come from and seek common ground. Okay, let's move on. Here's takeaway number five. Give good reasons for the arguments you make. An argument consists of a line of reasoning that supports a conclusion. An assertion, on the other hand, simply makes a claim. For example, if you tell a friend not to eat at a certain restaurant because a meal there gave you food poisoning, you've made an argument. If you only tell the person you dislike the restaurant, you've made an assertion. The statements that make up an argument are called premises. The so-called standard form is a simplified way of laying out an argument, so you can study it. In the standard form, you list the premises in order and state the conclusion at the end. Spelling out the explicit and implicit premises of an argument allows you to clarify the thinking and pinpoint weaknesses. Two main kinds of arguments exist, deductive and inductive. In deductive reasoning, the conclusion follows from the premises according to logical rules. For example, if X and Y are true, then Z is also true. An inductive reasoning, a conclusion, follows from the observation of a pattern. All right, time for another takeaway. Seek meaningful explanations for the world around you and consider the strongest arguments in favor of the viewpoints you encounter. When you encounter a point of view you disagree with, build steel men instead of straw men. Building a straw man means oversimplifying an argument so you can easily dismiss it. Instead, state the strongest possible version of every argument you encounter. This way, you learn as much as possible from the person's position and put your own ideas to a meaningful test. When you seek to explain the world around you, search for explanations that offer rich insight and understanding. A worthy explanation is simple accounts for all relevant information, and doesn't ignore contradictory information. Challenge your beliefs by seeking falsification, evidence that would show them to be wrong. Be alert to confirmation bias, the human tendency to see evidence that confirms existing beliefs and to ignore evidence that falsifies them. We've now reached takeaway number seven. Creativity can take many forms. Find a process that works for you. In contrast to imagination, which occurs in the privacy of your mind, creativity brings a new work, a novel, song, or business project, for example, into existence. Anyone can exercise creativity, not just certain people in artistic jobs, such as singers, actors, and writers. You can be creative in everyday life while doing mundane tasks. Originality doesn't mean creating something totally new. 
Often, it involves finding a new angle to answer an existing question. Creativity can take place through divergent thinking, freely generating different ideas or convergent thinking, selecting one particular idea to develop and discarding others. Children tend to engage in divergent thinking. Educational systems usually teach convergent thinking. Anthropologist and artist Aitan Buchalter proposes a six-step process for creative thinking. He recommends first identifying an area of interest, then reflect on your knowledge, playfully experiment, record your findings, and research other work done in the area. Review what you've learned and synthesize that knowledge to think more creatively. When you approach creative work, set a practical goal. Consider the obstacles you face and the assets you have and make a decision about what specific actions you'll take. When collaborating, emphasize communication and focus on common values. Engage in active listening. Attend closely to what the other person says. Don't interrupt. Ask specific questions to clarify and summarize your understanding. Okay, here's takeaway number eight. Seek the story behind numbers and statistics. Many people view numbers as objective measures of the world. They see data as unbiased, raw material, and statistics as the direct result of processing this raw data. The reality is less clear-cut. To improve your assessments of claims that include statistics, learn how statistics work. Several signs can indicate that a statistics-based claim might be unreliable. Look for phrases like up to or as much as. These suggest the writer or speaker is using the maximum end of a range for emotional impact. Also watch for comparisons of two unrelated phenomena, as if they had a causal connection. For example, when politicians compare household debt and national debt, other clues include the use of misleading visuals, mentioning very large numbers with little explanation, and placing a misleading focus on percentage changes versus absolute changes. Media outlets often take statistics out of context and sensationalize them. Always dig into the story behind the numbers. No statistic perfectly describes reality. This gap between reality and statistics often results from variability. For example, a population statistic reflects the population at one particular moment in time, but births, deaths, immigration, and emigration constantly change the real number. Statistical samples should be as representative as possible. For example, if you want to find out how to run a company, you should sample the opinions of CEOs, not those of random people on the street. Any statistics soundness depends on how well the data represent the phenomenon, and a statistics usefulness depends on your awareness of its limitations. Now for the ninth and final takeaway. No technology is neutral. Notice whom it benefits. Fundamental differences exist between artificial intelligence, AI, and human thinking. AI can process larger volumes of data than humans can process, and at greater speed. AI provides answers, performing exceptionally well in identifying and analyzing patterns. Human intelligence asks questions, applies imagination, and seeks meaningful understanding. No algorithm-based technology is neutral. For example, when schools shut down during the COVID-19 pandemic, the United Kingdom tested an algorithmic tool to predict the results students would have achieved if they had been able to take their exams. AI-generated predictions consistently gave students lower scores than teachers predicted in patterns that reflected existing systemic inequities. Be aware of AI's limitations and always seek to apply technology in an ethical and critically engaged way. That was a summary of How to Think, a book by Tom Chatfield. Here's a recap of the nine takeaways. Takeaway one, thinking about your own thinking can help you understand yourself and the world. Takeaway number two, attentiveness and reflection build habits that support clear and critical thinking. Takeaway three, strive for clarity and logic in framing your arguments and in understanding those you hear and read. The fourth takeaway, question and engage with your own and others' assumptions. Takeaway five, give good reasons for the arguments you make. Takeaway six, 
Seek meaningful explanations for the world around you and consider the strongest arguments in favor of the viewpoints you encounter. The seventh takeaway, creativity can take many forms. Find a process that works for you. Takeaway eight, seek the story behind numbers and statistics. And takeaway nine, no technology is neutral. Notice whom it benefits.